Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Whatever time you may be watching this particular telecast, again, we just want to thank you so much for joining us for these sessions. By God's grace, we've been able to get through seven particular uh, powerful discourses. And Lord willing, uh, this particular session is going to be no different. In our last session, we were going over and we were laying a foundation as it pertained to the principles of health reform. And we're going to continue that same theme in this particular session. And so without further ado, I'm going to have a word of prayer. And by God's grace, we will begin. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much again for coming to Tabernacle here with us. We pray that your Holy Spirit may be with us in a very marked manner. I pray that you would please be with my mind and my heart. I pray that you be with the communication of these truths. And I pray that you be with all those that are going to be watching this uh, online, watching now and watching in the future for these subjects of health reform, especially are so very important for us to understand. Because if we're going to be spiritually and practically prepared for the times in which we're currently living and the time in which we are soon hastening, we must really seek to come up higher upon the point of health reform. And so I just pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to understand the grave seriousness of this. We cannot merely listen to these things passively and continue to perform the same acts. I just pray, dear Lord, that you would please keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, in light of that, let's open up our Bibles. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12. And let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12. So again, we were able to lay a foundation as it pertained to the principles of health reform in our previous session. We saw that, especially as it related to health reform, that sadly, Satan has done a very great job to degrade this precious and important subject, not just at the world at large, but especially amongst us as Seventh-day Adventists. We saw very clearly in Luke chapter 6 that just as that man had a withered right hand, health reform and medical missionary work has become just like the withered right hand of that man whom Jesus healed. And especially, again, if we're going to be prepared for the times in which we're currently living and the times to which we are soon hastening, we need to take these principles of health reform very, very seriously. Now, in light of that, we're going to read in Romans chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says. This says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So it's reasonable to serve and to meet out the dictates of God. In verse 2 it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the Lord is communicating to us very clearly, again, if we are going to have soundness spiritually, Mentally, we must have soundness also physically. And that very uh, famous text in 3 John 2, where the Bible says that, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now, we know that there are met, uh, very many prosperity preachers who have grossly taken that text out of context, but God is just clearly and simply communicating that he wants us to be physically well, just as we are spiritually well. Now, as we take a look at our screen, this is just as a means of review. We see here a symbol of nutrition, a symbol of nutrition. Again, the Bible said in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 14. All right, it says our bodies are built up of the food that we eat. Okay, so we saw this already. It's a very wonderful process. Poor diets threaten U.S. national security. We found out that as a result of all of the chronic obesity, especially in the United States and in many Western countries, that this has become a national security a threat, particularly in the United States. All right, we're going to skip past this. This says, across the globe, our diets are making us sicker, report fines. All right, again, this dear woman eating McDonald's fries, not realizing that she is directly contributing to the degradation of her body. Now, we didn't put this in the last session, 
But it's actually amazing when you do just a little bit of research, not a vast amount of digging, but when you do a little bit of research, you'll actually find out that Bill Gates is actually the greatest um, uh, funder and the greatest uh, exporter of the potatoes and the vegetables that, it, that are used in these fast food restaurants. And yes, all of the food that he is producing is genetically modified. All right, we saw this already. McDonald's, they make around $36 billion in revenue every year. All right, the global uh, siren call for fast food. Okay, we saw this. Learn. So this says, the only hope of better things is the education of the people in right principles. From the beginning of the health reform work, we have found it necessary to educate, educate, educate. And again, by God's grace, we're going to seek to educate as much as we possibly can within these sessions. God desires us to continue this work of educating the people. All right, now on our screen, we have a symbol of money, particularly the U.S. dollar. Now, in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, what we want to find out as we go through this particular point, we want to understand, especially in the Western world, certainly in America, why is it that there is such a concerted effort to ensure the vast majority of the population is sick? Why is this? First Timothy chapter six, we're going to start in verse, we're going to start in verse nine. The Bible says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the Bible clearly here communicates that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now again, I wonder if the love of money is the direct driving force as to the reason why so much of the food policy in the United States is what it is. Notice. On our screen, we have a symbol of something called milk. Now, especially in the U.S., there was a vast concerted public relations effort in order to condition the common person to believe that in order for them to have calcium and strong bones, that they needed to drink cow's milk. I wonder if this was based in fact or if it was based in money. This says USDA dietary guidelines are driven by milk marketing concerns not nutrition. Now notice, this is taken from the Washington Post. These are not, as it were, fringe health journals, as some people try to allege. A federal agency has uh, just been sued for urging Americans to go big on milk, cheese, and other dairy. Three doctors filed a lawsuit Wednesday in federal court against the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or the USDA for its guidance in December suggesting that Americans consume three servings of dairy each day. Notice at the bottom, the USDA's conflict of interest is perhaps best illustrated in the statement that most individuals would benefit by increasing intake of dairy, even though it, there is no convincing evidence that this is true. So for a vast amount of time in the United States, especially literally going on for decades, it has been chronically repeated to the to the American population that milk and dairy and all of these things is essential for nutrition and health. But it was never driven by actual nutritional facts, but it was simply driven by the fact that these companies wanted to make a profit. Notice. We're going to skip past now on our screen. We have a symbol of a burger, especially in the United States. The amount of meat that we as Americans consume, it is literally sinful. It is literally sinful. Even if you do not consider yourself plant-based or whatever may have you, the amount of meat that we are consuming, it is, it, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Notice this. The U.S. meat industry's wildly successful 40-year crusade to keep its hold on the American diet. Notice. The size of the U.S. meat industry is immense. Notice this. 
Beef alone is a $95 billion a year business. That's just beef. That's not talking about chicken. That's not talking about fish, lobster, crab, or shrimp. That's simply beef. At the bottom, it says, and the North American Meat Institute estimates that in total, the meat industry contributes about $894 billion to the U.S. economy. That size translates into political influence. In 2014, the industry spent approximately $11 million in contributions to political campaigns. Now, again, whether you're talking about the food industry, whether you are talking about the military industrial complex, one of the great reasons why all of these policies foreign and domestically are initiated in the United States is because of all of the vast lobbying that takes place within the government. All right, we're going to skip past this, skip past. Now, I'm pretty sure some of us are familiar with this. This is the food pyramid that was greatly encouraged in the United States. Doctors group sues USDA over vegetarian alternative to the food pyramid. So these plant-based doctors actually sued the USDA because as they've done collective research, it's been made abundantly clear that the USDA was not primarily concerned with the health and wellness of the US population, that they were merely serving the interests of these gigantic food companies and monopolies. All right, we're gonna skip past this. All right, now on our screen is a gentleman by the name of T. Colin Campbell. He wrote a very powerful volume in collaboration with some others called The China Study. Notice what he says in this book. As you will come to see, much is governed by the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. There are powerful, influential, and enormously wealthy industries, notice, that stand to lose a vast amount of money if Americans start shifting to a plant-based diet. Their financial health depends on controlling what the public knows about nutrition and health. I wonder if it's the same here at home in Africa. It says the entire system, government, science, medicine, industry, media, and academia promotes profits over health, technology over food, and confusion over clarity. At the bottom, it is a silent enemy that few people see and understand. Now, on our screen, we have a symbol of the medical industry. Now, this is a question. I wonder if the modern medical industry is primarily concerned with monetary profit and gain as opposed to the health and wellness of their patients. I wonder. Notice. Again, this is from the China study. The medical status quo relies heavily on medication and surgery at the exclusion of nutrition and lifestyle. Doctors have virtually no training in nutrition and how it relates to health. You see, if doctors were properly trained, many times when we would go to the doctor, instead of them uh, prescribing medication, they would simply prescribe for us to eat more apples. They would simply prescribe for us to, to get more rest, to drink more water, to get more exercise. But unfortunately, because they're primarily concerned with profits, and again, this is not every doctor, but the vast majority of the medical industry is not concerned with the health and wellness of their patients. All right, in the middle, it says the committee concluded that nutrition education programs in the U.S. medical schools are largely inadequate. At the bottom, it says the U.S. medical schools received inadequate recognition, support, and attention. Now, on our screen, again, we have a symbol of drug medication. Drug medication. John is not alone in criticizing the way in which the medical establishment has partnered with the drug industry. The drug industry ingratiates itself with medical students with free gifts, including meals, entertainment, and travel, educational events, including lectures. You know, it's amazing. Over in the United States, uh, there was actually a particular doctor who just got 40 years in prison because it came out that he was intentionally misdiagnosing people as having cancer. Some, you know, very mild stages of cancer and some very advanced stages of cancer. 
And as a result of these individuals believing that they had cancer, they would then proceed to get chemotherapy and radiation. And this man literally destroyed the lives of many people simply that he could get financial kickbacks from these, from these, uh, pharma, from these pharmaceutical companies. Now again, though that, that was that one doctor, I can promise you that is not the only health practitioner that is doing these nefarious things. Notice. This says research and academic medicine merely carry out the pharmaceutical industry's bidding. This says this can happen because the drug companies, not researchers, may design the research, which allows the company to rig the study. The researchers may have direct financial stake in the drug company whose product they are studying. The drug company may retain veto power over whether the findings are published. So at least I believe by God's grace, we've been able to see in some detail the unfortunate conflict of interest that resides within the modern medical industry. And again, this is one of the great reasons why we have been so miseducated as to the relation of pop proper nutrition relating to our constitution. All right, now what we're going to do, we're going to go through something as we see on our screen called food classification. We want to understand from a Bible standpoint the most ideal diet that God has given to humanity. Now in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the beginning. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis and let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Genesis. Let's notice what the Bible says in part in the book of Genesis. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. Let's notice what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to start in verse uh, 5. We're going to start in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 2. All right, notice what the Bible says. It says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused, caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole earth, watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living, a living soul. It says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground uh, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it talks about all of the rivers and all of these things that were associated with the Garden of Eden. Now you can read about this again in Genesis 2 and in Genesis chapter 1. But the original diet that God had given to humanity was subsisting upon a plant-based as it were diet. This was the most ideal uh, form of nutrition that God had given to humanity. Now, let's look at our screen and we're going to notice a few things. This says, in order to know what are the best foods, we must study God's original plan for man's diet. He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Notice, behold, he said, I have given you every herb yielding seed and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for food. All right, now we see on our screen, Genesis chapter 1 in verse 11 and 29. Now we just re read some of these statements in Genesis chapter 2, but let's turn back to Genesis chapter 1 in verse 11. Again, notice what the Bible says. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit uh, tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. It says, and the earth brought forth grass and the herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, again, now jumping to verse 29, notice what the Bible says. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for me. So we see here clearly from the sacred writings that in the beginning of time, man's meat was not flesh meat, but it was the flesh of the fruits 
that he was eating. It was not flesh meat, but it was the flesh of the fruits upon which he was subsisting. All right, now this is, again, back to the screen. This says Genesis 1, 11, verse 29. Uh, 11 and 29, this is before sin. So again, number one, we have the herb-yielding seed. And you can take a picture of this or take a screenshot of it. Herb-yielding seed, for the sake of time, we're not going go to go uh, turn to all of these texts. But Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 31 and 32 Numbers 11 and verse 7, and Numbers 20 in verse 5. And the tree, Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, Joel 1 and verse 12, Deuteronomy 20 and verse 19 and 20. So we see here clearly, we have the herb yielding seed, and then we have the tree bearing fruit. All right, so the herb yielding seed, so this is an illustration of what this herb yielding seed would be. This would be the nuts, the seeds, and the grains. So before sin, besides the fruit that God had given, man was also subsisting on the seeds, the nuts, and the grains. In addition, the tree with the fruit of a tree, this is the figs, peaches, and apples. So essentially, any form of tree that helps to produce fruit. So that could be bananas, you know, that could be um, avocados, whatever the case uh, may be. There, is a, there was a vast variety of a fruit that God had provided for Adam and Eve. And you know, it's actually amazing. Um, a couple nights ago, my wife and I were looking at a channel on YouTube where it is a, a gentleman and his uh, companion, and they have been subsisting on, on nothing but fruit, I believe, for a, a, a number of years. And it is amazing the places that they have gone to around the world with fruit that I literally have never seen. Fruit that looks just so delect delectable and luscious. I mean, it literally makes you believe that they were in the Garden of Eden. Absolutely amazing. This says, upon leaving Eden to gain his livelihood by tilling the earth under the curse of sin, man received permission to eat also the herb of the field. So this is fast forwarding after sin when man was given permission to eat the herb of the field. Now let's turn to that. In Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to uh, turn to verse uh, 17. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to turn to verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So this is actually talking about the vegetation, the vegetables. So this is to clarify. Before sin, man was not eating lettuce. He was not eating onions. He was not eating kale or collard greens. He was not subsisting upon these things. But after the entrance of sin into the human experience... It became necessary for Adam now to, or the human race, as it were, to be able to uh, partake of the vegetation that grew as a result of this herb of the field. In verse 19, it says, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou uh, wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now going back to the screen, notice what this says. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. So this is very clear. Even after sin, God had not yet given man permission to subsist upon a meat diet. After sin, he had the, the, um, the uh, herb-bearing uh, seed, he had the, the fruits of the tree, and he also had the herb of the field, but he did not have meat a part of his diet. It says, these, food prepared, these foods prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength and a power of endurance and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. Okay, so after sin, we have Genesis 3.18. We have the herbs of the field, Genesis 9.3, 2 Kings 19.26. Psalms 104 and verse 14. And, and again, an example of that is simply the vegetables or the vegetation. All right. 
Now, after the flood, now we're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of, actually, we're already in Genesis, but let's turn to chapter 9. Let's turn to chapter 9. We want to get an understanding as to when man was given permission to subsist upon meat. Not wholly subsist upon it, but when God gave permission for man to partake of flesh. Genesis chapter 9, we're going to uh, read, we're going to read in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 9. Again, this is after the flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth. And upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. Of, ye shall not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. So even though God had given man permission to, to partake of the flesh, God did not give man permission to eat flesh with blood in it. Now, when you go and actually read in Leviticus, it was not only blood, but the meat could not have fat in it either. It could not have the fat nor the blood. Now, actually, just for the sake of context, let's turn to that. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Leviticus chapter 3. Let's turn in our Bibles to, the, to Leviticus chapter 3. This is one of the great reasons why the Jewish people, or, and even as especially the ancient Hebrews, Hebrews did uh, always subsisted upon kosher meat. They always subsisted upon kosher meat. Leviticus chapter 3, we're going to read in verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. It shall be a perpetual stat statute for your generations throughout your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor nor blood. So the Bible is very unequivocal as it pertains to this point. And this point is emphasized, especially all throughout the book of Leviticus. Now, in addition to the meat having to be kosher, there were also stipulations in regards to what type of animals man was actually able to partake of. Now, let's turn in our Bibles back to Genesis. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 9. Let's turn back, to, back in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 9, and let's notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 9. So again, in verse uh, 4 it says, But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat it. So again, we see here the fact that they could not eat the blood, and we saw in Leviticus that it could not have the fat as a part of it. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book uh, already again in Genesis. Let's turn to chapter... Uh, let's turn to chapter 7. Let's turn to chapter 7. Notice what the Bible says. Now, we're also going to find out another stipulation that was given to man as it pertained to meat eating. In verse 2, it says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So very clearly we can see way before the, uh, the installation of the ancient Hebrew people that there was already a, cle a clear distinction between meat that was clean and meat that was unclean. And so in light of that, we can see very clearly that Noah was not eating that meat which was unclean, but that he was only eating that meat which was clean. So again, when God gave man permission to eat, the, um, to eat uh, partake of the animal population, the meat had to be clean. They had to be animals that were clean, and they also uh, could not have the fat nor the blood as a part of it. So by default, this meant that man could only eat kosher meat. And there were also other stipulations as well. When you go and read uh, through the book, uh, book of Leviticus, the meat could not have died of its own self. The meat could not have had diseases in it or any of these other things. And so as a result of that, we see here very clearly that through all of these principles, God was sacredly and intricately trying to preserve the health of his people. And sadly, it's as a result of only as a uh, as a result of the Ava deviation 
from this ideal that man has received so much degradation. Now, by default, this is the principle. If we are to follow God's principles, even if we want to subsist upon meat, which is principally not the best, but if we want to subsist upon it, we have to eat that meat that is clean and meat that does not have blood nor fat in it. So by default, this means that KFC would be completely off the menu. That means that McDonald's and Burger King would be completely off of the menu. If we are going to preserve our bodies and health, we must follow God's sacred and loving principles. Now again, back to our screen. This says, number one, flesh every moving thing, Genesis 9, 4, Leviticus 17, 10. We see this. Flesh, fowl, and beef. You, again, you can take a screenshot of this picture. It says the question of how to preserve the health is one of primary importance. When we study this question in the fear of God, we shall learn that it is best for both our physical and our spiritual advancement to observe simplicity in diet. Let us patiently study this question. We need knowledge and judgment. And again, especially when it comes to health reform, we want to have a very balanced approach when we are stu studying and broaching this subject. We don't want to go to any extremes, to the left nor to the right. We want to have a clear and balanced understanding of what God desires for us as his children. All right. It says, those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh foods, tea and coffee, and rich and unhealthful food preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice, will not continue to indulge their appetite for food that they know to be unhealthful. You know, the Bible actually tells us in the New Testament that there are a large class of people whose belly is their God. And sadly, for very many of us as Christians, even many of us as Seventh-day Adventists, our bellies have become our gods. And instead of serving the loving God of the universe, we're serving our debased appetite. And this is why we need to pray, brothers and sisters, that God will give us victory over these demonic strongholds. It says, this is a work that will have to be done before his people can stand before him, a perfected people. I mean, because think about this. How in the world can we say that we are serving God in spirit and in truth and we're constantly indulging our appetites, bringing disease and wretchedness upon our bodies? Because principally, if we continue in these practices, we will actually be guilty of suicide. All right. Now, on our screen, we have a symbol of meat. Now, does anybody know what type of meat this is? Yes. Now, this is actually a symbol of something called pork chops. Now, pork chops is a very lovely delicacy that very, that very many people around the world love to enjoy and indulge. But notice this. Let the diet reform be progressive. Let the people be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or butter. Tell them that the time will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter because the disease in animals is increasing. Notice in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. Now, when she says, now this is the prophet speaking again, when she says that the time will soon come, you see, we have to understand in context, this statement was written over a hundred years ago. So by default, we've already come to that time. We've been in that time for a very long amount of duration. Now also as well, some person will say, well, that's just sis, uh, Sister White's ideas that she's coming up with. That has no foundation in the word of God. Notice this. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of uh, Hosea. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says. Hosea chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish. Notice, with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. 
So everything that we just read in the spirit of prophecy is clearly here in the word of God, in the Bible. You see, brothers and sisters, God was simply communicating to us that sadly as a result of the sins of men, that this would directly affect the animal population, which in turn would make it very dangerous for us to subsist upon food coming from those sources. Notice, again, pork chops. This is taken from the New York Post in 2019. Global pork prices rise amid China's pig disease outbreak. China produces and consumes two-thirds of the world's pork, but output is plunging as Beijing destroys hers and blocks shipments to stop African swine fever. Importers are filling the gap by buying pork as far away as Europe, boosting prices by 40%. So this talks about all of the pigs that had to be killed as a result of these outbreaks. Again, modern uh, modernity just confirming what we just read in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now, some person may say, well, I don't eat pork chops. I only eat clean meat. Notice this. 12 million pounds of beef are recalled for possible salmonella. Check your freezer. Now, I don't have the date on here, but I believe this is probably around the, the time of 2019 or before. This says an Arizona-based meat company recalled more than 5.1 million pounds of raw beef on Tuesday because it, may, uh, because it may be contained with salmonella. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food Safety and Inspection Service. I mean, that is a lot of beef. Notice what it says. Already recalled in October for a total of 12 million pounds of beef. That's the amount some 55,000 Americans typically eat over a year. Now, just imagine this. There are roughly around 350 million people in the United States alone, but only 55,000 are consuming 12 million pounds of beef every year. So in light of that, you can only imagine the amount of beef that Americans are consuming every year. I wonder if that's the reason that uh, we as Americans are dealing with so many things like high blood pressure and heart disease and cancer and hypertension and strokes and heart attacks. I wonder. Now, again, somebody says that I don't uh, eat beef. I only eat fish. Some of those more leaner type things. Notice mercury in fish is more dangerous than belief. Science urges scientists urge. The reports produced by the Biodiversity Research Institute and an international coalition of environmental campaign group called the Zero Mercury Working Group say that mercury contamination of seafood is not only on the rise across the globe, but that smaller traces of the toxic metal may be enough to cause restricted brain development or other health problems for humans who eat them. The more we look at mercury, the more toxic it is. And brothers and sisters, the sad reality that there is a, uh, a very small minority of seafood, especially fish, in the world today that is not infected with mercury. That is not infected with mercury. Now notice what the prophet says as it pertains to this. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. You see, brothers and sisters, especially for those of us that are still uh, subsisting upon a meat diet, we really need to pray that God will give us the victory to start making that transition. Because especially as we have just, go as we have just gone through, if our bodies are going to be able to properly give glory to God, we need to put the best type of fuel into our somatic structures. This says flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily towards it. In the middle, all who are connected with our health institutions especially should be educating themselves to subsist notice upon fruits, grains, and vegetables. And one of the blessings of, of healthful cookery is that you can truly learn how to create these things in so appetizing a manner that you won't even desire meat anymore. All right, now this is a very powerful statement. Notice what this says in councils on diet and foods. Greater reform should be seen among the people who claim to be looking for the soon appearing of Christ. 
health reform is to do among our people a work which it has not yet done. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering the physical, mental, and spiritual health. And again, contrary to popular opinion, health reform is a salvific issue. Don't let anyone deceive you into believing that this has nothing to do with your salvation. Because the person who says that what you eat has nothing to do with your eternal destiny shows simply that they do not understand the principles of anatomy and physiology. This is the principle. The food that we eat gets broken down in our digestive system and that food actually helps to make up the blood that courses through our veins. So if we are eating food that is making bad blood that is coursing through our veins, by default, it is going to affect our brain, which houses our mind, and the mind is used in order to commune with God. So the more debased our food is, is the, is the less ability we will have to commune with God. But on the opposite end, the more healthful our food is, the better our blood. And the better our blood, the better is our brain especially nourished. And if our brain has good nourishment, that means that the mind will be able to think more clearly, thus enhancing our communion with God. Notice what this goes on to say. Many who are now only half converted, this is a startling statement. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. Brothers and sisters, that is very serious. Again, even as myself, I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. I grew up eating meat. You know, my father's Guyanese. You know, I grew up in a, in a Caribbean atmosphere. So I grew up eating, you know, jerk chicken and curry chicken and, and stew beef and all of these things. I was unaware of these principles of health reform. But this is the thing again. If God in mercy brings these truths to us, but we reject it and persist in walking in the darkness, by default, there is nothing more than, that God can do for us. All right, we're going to seek to bring this message to a close. Now, on our screen, we have a symbol of something called plant-based food. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but these pancakes look very delicious. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. All right. Now, on our screen, we have a symbol of a, a, a burger. I believe that may be falafels in it. And this is, again, is a symbol of plant-based food look, looking very delicious. This is a symbol, I believe, of, some, of an Indian dish. This is some fried tofu, I believe, with some lentil curry, uh, with some uh, lentil uh, curry and some uh, jasmine rice. And that looks very delicious. All right. This is, I believe, a butternut squash with some melted vegan cheese on it. Again, this food looks amazing. All right. And we have, again, some, falaf uh, some falafels uh, with some uh, pita bread or whatever may have you. All right. This says interest in veganism is surging. It is literally amazing and astounding how much, so much, how much of the world is running with this idea of a plant-based diet. For years, Britain's intent on a virtuous start to the year have pledged to observe an alcohol-free dry January. These days, however, a trendier resolution is to swear off meat. This month, according to Google Trends, there are about as many British searches for a vegan veganary in which participants adopt a vegan diet for a month. As for dry January for the first time, this says Veganary UK, the charity behind the annual campaign, says 350,000 signed up this year, up from 250,000 in 2019. So there are literally over a quarter of a million people. This is around uh, 2020 who are seeking to adopt a plant-based diet to better their health. Now, mind you, I'm pretty sure that the vast majority of the persons that, that participated in this uh, veganary know nothing of the third angel's message. But because they want to keep their bodies in health, they are willing to take care of themselves. I mean, it is really sad that for so many of us as Seventh-day Adventists, when we hear of the concepts of health reform and medical missionary work, Instead of joyfully embracing it, we spurn it as heresy. All right, this says enthusiasm for veganism is not limited to Britain. Are we going to skip past this? 
Now on the screen, we have a symbol of a man who is an athlete. Notice this, runner. My super power vegan diet helped me smash records. There are so many athletes around the world that are switching to a plant-based diet because they realize that it is giving them better results in their athletic competitions. This says, from Business Insider, these 19 elite athletes are vegan. Here's what made them switch their diet. Notice these names. Venus Williams in tennis. Lewis Ham Hamilton, Formula One. Kyrie Irving, basketball. David Hay, boxing. So many of these athletes. Notice what inspiration says. It is a mistake to suppose that muscular strength depends on the use of animal food. The needs of the system can be better supplied and a more vigorous health can be enjoyed without its use. The grains with fruits, nuts, vegetables contain all the nutritive properties necessary to make good blood. It said, had the use of flesh been essential to health and strength, animal food would have been included in the diet appointed to man in the beginning. All right, this says, God gave our first parents the food he designed that, they, that the race should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. There was no death in Eden. You know, it's so amazing. I remember um, some of uh, myself and some of my uh, colleagues back in the United States, we were uh, doing some literature evangelism and we came up to a gentleman, we came up to his house, and this man knew that we were Seventh-day Adventists. And he said that he doesn't like Seventh-day Adventists because we advocate a plant-based diet. And this man was literally trying to argue with us that Adam and Eve were literally killing and eating animals in the Garden of Eden. As a result of that, I didn't try to argue with the man. You know, I left him alone and just said, you know, God bless you. Amen. God gave man no permission to eat animal food after the flood. Let our people discard all unhealthful Unhe unwholesome, sorry, unwholesome recipes. Let them learn how to live healthfully, teaching to others what they have learned. Let them impart this knowledge as they would Bible instruction. Again, these principles are, of health reform are just as essential as the doctrinal truths that God has given to us. Because again, this is the principle. How can we really enjoy having fellowship with Christ when we're debilitated in our physical system. And yes, it is very true that there are some people that God permits to go through sicknesses, and that is directly his will. You know, for instance, like Job and, and many others over the course of human history. But the vast majority of us that are dealing with sickness, it's not as a result of God, but as a result of our bad decisions or maybe of things we have inherited. We're going to skip past this. Now we're coming to a close again. On our screen, we have a symbol of the judgment. I wonder if what we eat and drink has anything to do with us being able to pass the investigative judgment. Notice. Our habits of eating and drinking show whether we are of the world or among the number whom the Lord by his mighty cleaver of truth has separated from the world. What this is saying, how we eat and drink what we put out on our tables really helps to determine and show how serious we are really taking the three angels' messages. You know, it's amazing when you read about the experience of Solomon. We're told in 1 Kings chapter 10 that one of the things that convinced the queen of Sheba that, that, that the God of the Hebrews was really the true God was how they sat and ate at their table. This says these are... Uh, these are his peculiar people, zealous of good works. God has spoken in his word. In the case of Daniel and his three companions, there are sermons upon health reform. All right. And again, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we, uh, this is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. And again, brothers and sisters, the appeal is just very, very simple. If we are going to be properly fitted to do the work that God has called us to do, and again, we understand that everything that pertains to health reform is not wholly subsisted in nutrition, but if we are truly going to be health reformers, we must start with the things that we put into our mouths. And again, even for some of us who have been subsisting upon a meat diet 
for a very long time. God does not condemn us. He is simply encouraging us to come up higher. And I can certainly attest from personal experience. When I made the transition to a plant-based diet, it not only helped me physically, mentally, but also spiritually. And the Lord wants to do the same for each and every one of us. And in light of that, we will have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the simple principles that we were able to go over. Lord, it is only the enemy that wants to keep us debilitated, that wants to keep us slaves to our appetite. Dear Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for not having taken proper care of our bodies. It is, it is truly shameful, not, not in a sense of condemnation, but it is truly shameful that so many persons in the world who know nothing of the Bible, who know nothing of the third angel's message, can be so eager to take care of their health but those of us who profess to be a part of the remnant people of God find it so hard to make a transition to the things that you have given to us. I just pray, dear Lord, that you would please give us victory over these demonic strongholds so that we can truly have that clarity of mind, body, and spirit that you so desperately desire for us to have. And as we're told again in your word, that beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. And again, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.